FSA exams can really be intimidating, especially if you're just coming off the prelims. The syllabus is enormous, and it seems like there's just so much to know. So where do you start? Well, as Stephen Covey said in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, begin with the end in mind. And with FSA exams, that means starting by understanding the format of the exam, understanding the exam day experience that you'll go through, understand the nature of the syllabus readings, and importantly, understand the mindset that you're really going to need in your preparation. We're going to talk about all of those things in this video. So a pop quiz, since you're probably coming off the prelims and you're used to multiple choice questions at this point, here's one more multiple choice question for you. By taking this exam, what is your goal? Is it to become an expert in the syllabus material? Is it to get every calculation exactly right on the exam? Is it to memorize every line of the source material? Or D, is it to impress normal people? Well, by now we know that passing actual exams only impresses other actuaries so we can rule out D, but the answer is yes, none of the above. Your goal is simply to pass the exam. And honestly, none of these things on its own really helps you achieve that. I generally see two camps of people, you might say, that get into trouble uh, when they try to apply prelim techniques to FSA exams. Some try to memorize all the flashcards right away. That's what they get started on. Other people end up spending way too much time on calculation problems and really obsess over getting calculations exactly right. They really obsess over precision, which of course the prelims train you to do that because precision really does matter. 6.24 is different than 6.25 on the prelims, not so much on FSA questions. And because typically over half the questions that you'll see on the exam will require some sort of verbal response, it just doesn't make sense to overweight your time on calculation practice. What you really need is a concept-driven focus, and I'll explain more about that in a moment. So again, staying on the theme of beginning with the end in mind, passing really begins with understanding the format of the exam itself. So this is what a very typical exam question looks like on a fellowship exam. So each question is worth a specified number of points. It's a very important thing to understand, and I'm going to say a lot more about this in just a moment. Questions typically have multiple subparts to them, okay? So a single question will be made up of multiple sub-questions. Some questions are very direct to the point, kind of like this one here. Others almost have sort of like a story or like a case study type approach where you'll get a lot of background information and then you'll be asked to uh, do calculations or provide explanations and things like that. Another very important component to an exam question is the verb that appears in the actual question being asked. More on those later. So this is what a typical question looks like. And at your Prometric workstation where you take the exam, you'll be given a copy of the exam in PDF form, a copy in Microsoft Word format, and also an Excel file for answering any questions that the Word file directs you to answer in Excel. Now your exam will probably have anywhere from five to eight total questions on it, just depending on the length of your particular exam and its runtime. And I'll say more on exam runtimes in just a moment, but each individual question will look something like this, okay? Just taking a closer look at an example of the Word file that you'll have in Prometric, a question looks like this. It will have the total point value at the top. It will often have some amount of background information before the first sub-question begins. And each question will average about four subparts per question, but that will vary quite a lot. Some questions don't have any subparts. Some may have A through G. Often they will put the point value at this level. This question is asking you to critique various statements and you'll put your answer here in Word. And then as we scroll down to the next page, part B is a calculation question where we're given uh, some numerical information and we're told to put the response in Excel. And most of the time for these, the SOA will provide a separate tab for that question. They'll include all the pertinent information needed to answer this specific part in Excel. Typically, they will put it in a gray shaded area like this, and they'll give you some room to build out your answer in Excel. You can, of course, add rows here, and we'll get into more detail in other videos on strategy around answering in Excel. But those are really the two broad categories of questions on the exam those that require an answer in Word, or questions that require a response in Excel. 
Now currently FSA exam run times vary anywhere from three hours to four hours depending on the exam you're taking and also the track that you happen to be on. And the total point value of the exam is also proportional to the exam runtime. So if it's a three hour exam, that's a 60 point exam in total. So you'll probably see anywhere from five to six total questions there. Three and a half hour exams are 70 points. Those will probably have an additional question compared to the three hour exams. And of course, four hour exams are the largest. Those will be 80 points and probably have anywhere from seven to nine questions, just depending on how large they make each question. But in all cases, the total point value will always add up to these totals that you see listed here. And it will always work out that you have exactly three minutes per point exactly to work each question on average. And that's a very important number to understand, both in total and at the question level. So let's talk more about points. I mean, really, what is the point of points? They really have two points, you might say, two points to points. First, it tells you the question's relative importance to the total score. A 12 point question on a 60 point exam is 20% of all points. More importantly, from a practical standpoint, the points tell you how much time you have available to spend on each question and each subpart, because often subparts also include the point values. And this is very important, okay? It's important to not only understand this, but get in the habit of practicing this, especially in the last month or so before the exam when you're taking uh, practice exam questions. Be sure to time yourself and pretend like you're on the clock because it's very easy to run out of time, especially if you don't practice time management. So that's a critical skill that you'll need on the exam. So here's a sample 10 point question. That means the maximum time you have available is 30 minutes, okay, 10 times three. And that's of course because you have to have time available to work the other questions on the exam. If you were to spend more than 30 minutes on this question, you'll have to compromise your time on other questions. And that's generally a bad idea, okay, because usually if you overspend time on a question, it's because it's a question you don't understand very well. You're probably not gonna get full credit on it anyway if you've run out of time. So the last thing you wanna do is take time away from other questions that you probably know that might be easier. And so again, practice is critical, okay? It's not something that can just come naturally to you without practice, being able to manage your time all the way down to the sub question level and just keeping up with how much time you spent, for example, on part B, okay? Notice each sub part has its own point value. So the four point sub parts here, you need to spend no more than 12 minutes on those. And in part C, it's two points, so you'd only need to spend six minutes at most on that. Okay, so generally the fewer points, that either means the less calculations are involved or it just means the less you have to write to get the, to get the question right. Because when time's up, time is up. There's no going back. Once your exam section time runs out or if you manually end the exam, you cannot go back and edit those Word and Excel files. You can only submit them at that point for grading. And the last thing you want to do is run out of time before you answer every question on the exam. Very difficult to pass a fellowship level exam if you leave entire questions blank. So how do you avoid that? Well, first, you really need to know the material as well as possible so that you can quickly retrieve syllabus facts from memory and synthesize all the stuff flying around in your head under exam conditions. But you also need to practice the exam and we've got more resources in our courses that go over specific strategy and techniques for taking CBT exams. Let's talk about the syllabus, okay? The syllabus tells you what the source readings are for the exam, and there are three types of readings that appear on the syllabus for a fellowship exam. There are textbooks. Uh, these are purchased at online bookstores like the Actuarial Bookstore or ACTAX, places like that. Uh, there are study notes, okay? These are authored either by the SOA or by other authors, and the SOA basically acquires a license to sell these, okay? These are purchased through the SOA. And then we have published references which are freely available online. The syllabus will have hyperlinks to these that you can simply click on and download the PDF. But these are really the three main categories of readings that appear on the syllabus. Now there's no getting around it. The syllabus for the typical FSA exam is really big. And even though the SOA did shrink the size of the exam somewhat starting in the year 2023, most exams still have many hundreds of pages of technical literature. Depending on the track, some exams still have upwards of 1,700 plus pages. And even for the exams that were shrunk in size, 
the reduction in syllabus content was smaller than the reduction in points or runtime for the exam. And what that means is that what we saw across the board starting in 2023 is that there is now more to know per exam hour or per exam point, making it even more critical to know the syllabus very well. It's a huge potpourri of technical literature that you have to process, and it can be very intimidating to get through all that on your own. So you're going to need some coffee, probably, or tea, whatever your persuasion is on that. But honestly, the secret is actually inside the coffee, you might say, okay? This happens to be a caffeine molecule. And just like you learn in chemistry in college or quantum mechanics, if you understand the atomic structure of things, more generally the universe, you can build anything, okay? If you can boil things down to the elements, you understand that everything is just a combination of different elemental parts. And I would encourage you to approach the FSA syllabus in the same way. Focus on learning the elements, okay? The more you can get underneath the jargon and see the connections and the similarities and things, really the less you end up having to memorize by the time you get to the exam. And obviously that's very challenging if you only have a few months to prepare. But if you're using one of our courses, we have a number of advanced time management features built right in to our study platform that basically boils it down to what you need to work on on a day-by-day basis so that you get through everything. So in conclusion, a few key takeaways from this video, be sure that you understand the format of the exam and the time constraints that you're under on exam day. Stay on schedule while studying. Again, we have lots of tools available to help you do that, but it's critical to be disciplined and to continue moving forward. Even if you get tangled up in something, keep moving. It's very important to stay on schedule so that you can cover as much as possible. Practice time management on the exam. Practice typing in Word. Practice answering calculation questions in Excel. Practice writing out formulas. Practice explaining your work and time yourself while you're doing it so that you understand how long it takes. Focus on concepts before memorization. Again, use that first phase of your study process to learn as much as you can. Those concepts will stay with you longer. Memorizing lots of little facts early on is not going to help you because you'll probably just forget it anyway. Memorization is a short-term memory exercise. Save that for the final stretch before the exam. Be an active learner. Just because the exam itself is no longer handwritten, I still think people learn more if they take their own handwritten notes. Lots of studies have shown that. Type your notes into Word. Do things in Excel. Be active and engaged while you're learning. Don't just passively look at the material. And finally, don't be a perfectionist. I see people fall into this trap where they try to just absolutely perfect every single source reading. Honestly, that's impossible to do with the amount of time you had to prepare, but it's also something that you don't have to do to pass the exam or even get a 10. Don't obsess over very fine technical details. Don't try to become an expert. That's not your job here. Your job is to pass the exam and to be mostly proficient in all of the readings not an expert in any of the material. And so I hope this video was helpful. There's a lot to talk about because FSA exams are an enormous topic. It's an enormous commitment of your time and energy, but we're here to help you get the very most out of that time and give you the very best chance at success so that you can put these exams behind you and move forward with your career. Speaking of moving forward, if you're taking one of our courses, keep going. We're going to get into even more detail about other aspects of preparing for the exam and also a deeper dive on how exam questions are constructed.